Yes. Yes. Yes, the question was in that infinite limit that defined the neural tangent kernel, the widths of the layers were going to infinity and can they go to infinity at different rates? And that's indeed the reason for the sequence of papers in this area, that the simplest limit is that they all march to infinity in tandem and the weakest is that they can march at any rate whatsoever. And uh, so there have been a sequence of papers and our paper had the strongest kind of limit. Does not, no, it's the neural tangent kernel. What, the key part here is though that the, uh, the infinitely wide net has infinitesimally small learning rate. So you're really analyzing gradient flow. And that's probably why NTK is not as powerful as finite nets because it's implicitly training with very tiny learning rate. Yes, I still have time, right? Yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, okay, so the question was that in traditional optimization, the step size is controlled by the smoothness. At least that's the story. And uh, it, it, does, it, does it play any role in this? So yeah, in, in the paper we discussed this and no, that's not the answer. Uh, and you know, the smoothness bound is of course very pessimistic. Uh, it, it may not happen, it could happen, but it may not happen. And uh, I don't think that's what's going on. And certainly the exponential increase is not. Never. So, okay, we're not proving any kind of convergence result. We're just giving what uh, the previous question asked about was, it's an equivalence theory for various schedules. And we're saying this is equivalent to that. I, we're not showing this converges or is any good, yeah. Time for one more? Yeah, maybe. They're n by n, full dimensional. So the question was in matrix completion, the deep linear net, is there any rank constraint on the matrices? No, they are fully n by n matrices. Okay, maybe one more, or yeah, maybe. You know, uh, it's kind of open-ended, but do you have a position on the kind of question that you may have as to the greater independence of the neural networks and the greater independence of the data sets? Oh yeah, the question was uh, to prove generalization, do you have to bring something about the data set? Absolutely, I think it has to depend on the data set. We know that because of those experiments which show that deep nets can even fit uh, random data and probably you need something about the data set indeed. And that's what everybody's thinking about, those who are thinking about it. Maybe I'll stop there. Happy to take more questions in the break. Thank you. Thank you. Can you? So next we have can a you get another short spotlight session and uh, of course you can be anonymous. Could put this in a pocket or clip it somewhere, like on your belt loop or whatever. Whatever's easy and out of the way. I think you're all set. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> Uh, my name is Amir Asadi. Uh, uh, I want to talk about a new approach to training neural networks. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor, Professor Emmanuel Abbey. So we give a new multi-scale analysis of generalization of neural networks, and through this analysis, we, we give a new training procedure. So these are all, these all use ideas from high dimensional probability and information theory. From high dimensional probability, we are inspired by the method of chaining. It's originated from Kolmogorov. It's a powerful multi-scale technique for bounding the suprema of random processes. It has been used in statistical learning to get bounds, and specifically for neural nets as well. For example, by Antonia and Bartlett in their book, but it doesn't necessarily give any tra training algorithm because it's an algorithm independent technique. It's a uniform bound. But still, we're interested to know whether we can extract the core idea of training and create algorithms out of it. Therefore, we, we raise the following question. Can we couple the multi-scale nature of chaining with the multi-scale architecture of deep neural nets to divide training algorithms with performance guarantees? 
We see we, we first have to extend training to make it algorithm dependent. And then we, we want to see how will the training procedure driven by this theory look like. So the, the, the new training procedure is fundamentally different from SGD and its variants. It is based on the chain rule of relative entropy rather than chain rule of derivatives, as in backpropagation. It, it, in this approach, we, we no longer view the whole net as a single block, but we differentiate between, with, between the scales, between how deep into the net we're looking at. The analysis brings to light complexity measures based on a multi-level relative entropy rather than a single KL divergence term used as in fact Bayesian theory, uh, which takes into account the, the multi-level structure of neural nets. And the minimizer of the regularized risk can be characterized exactly by a multi-scale generalization of the Gibbs posterior distribution. So after giving the, the presenting the necessary notation, I'll talk a bit about this uh, chaining mutual information technique, this uh, algorithm dependent ex extension of chaining. And in the next, se next section, I will talk uh, how this technique can be naturally applied to the architecture of neural, net <coughs> neural nets. And then I will derive uh, generalization and, and excess risk bounds. And in the last section, we see how the training procedure looks like. So the standard notation, let X be the uh, instances domain, Y the labels domain, and Z the examples domain. H is the hypothesis set where W the set is the index set. Let L be the loss function and S the training set IID from an unknown distribution mu. For a, uh, hypothesis HW, we denote the statistical risk of L mu and the empirical risk of LS. And the difference between these two, the generalization error we denoted with this notation. We assume that given the training set, the algorithm is, a, uh, is modeled as a random transformation. And it picks one of the hypotheses uh, given by this random transformation, P of W given S. And then averaging with respect to the randomness in the, uh, in the training set and the algorithm, we denote the expected uh, generalization error with this notation and the expected statistical risk with, with this notation. And now in the next, next section, we, we first seek an upper bound on, on the expected generalization error with this uh, chaining mutual information technique. So in chaining, uh, the, the idea is to write uh, any random variable in a process uh, and as a refined approximation. So we write the chaining sum, uh, this telescoping sum where pi i's are the projections of t onto an increasing sequence of partitions of t. And then one applies the maximal inequality on each of the links to upper bound the supremum of xt. And then, then this gives a multi-scale bound on the supremum. Now, instead of writing a chain sum for a fixed index, uh, we, we write it with, for a random index w, where w is, is an output of an algorithm. And then we take expectation. And then we use the mutual information bound uh, for each of the links. And th th this will give a multi-scale and algorithm dependent bound on the expected bias of an algorithm. For example, if the pi i's are two to the minus k partitions, uh, and x is a separable sub-Gaussian process, uh, on an increasing sequence of two to the minus k partitions, the, the bound will look like this, where we have a mutual information between the discretized output and the random process with an exponentially decreasing weight. Now we, we will apply this technique differently for neural networks. We, we don't, instead of applying it to two to the minus k partitions of the hypothesis set, we, we want to adapt to the architecture of neural nets and we apply it to, to their generated covering as we uh, define here. So assuming that in a learning problem, uh, the hypothesis set consists of multi-level functions then we define the generated covering at level k by fixing the first k layer. So for neural nets, this, this will be layers. We fix the first k layers and then let the rest to be arbitrary. This will partition the space. More, more precisely, gk is the exact covering of w determined by all possible values of the first k components. And this, this gives a hierarchical covering. It will each uh, gk, gk plus one is a subset of gk, is, is, is a refined version of gk. A similar in nature to the notion of generated filtration, a random process. Now we want to see uh, this generated covering of neural nets, uh, how should we regularize the hypothesis set that we can control its diameter. So assume we have a feedforward neural net where w, uh, w's are the layers. 
and the nonlinearities of the rooms and the output, I guess, soft match or identity. By multi-level regularization, we mean we, we constrain each layer to be around a fixed matrix. So, so it's in a, in a cloud. So we, there's a reference matrix for each layer. And uh, in spectral norm, the, all the uh, layers, that, all the values that each matrix, uh, each layer can take is in this set. So and as an example could be when MIs are identity ma matrices, then this means that the layers are nearly identity functions something similar to residual nets. And then alpha i's uh, depends on how much representation power we need from this neural net. Uh, we, then we define the projection of any index w on the generator covering GK as keeping the first k layers intact, and then we replace the rest with the reference matrices. Okay, so some assumption, we let m be the product of the spectral norms of mi's, and assume that the instances domain, they are bounded in L2 by R. And then we also assume that the, the loss function has this Lipschitz property with constant L, so like a, a mean squared loss. With these assumptions, we can give the following uh, multi-scale and algorithm dependent uh, generalization bound, where for any P of W given S, any conditional distribution, the bound has a mutual information between the training set and the first k layers. Uh, it's multi-scale because it, 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 there are terms for, for all k from one to d. And um, the proof outline is, uh, yeah, writing a chain in some respect to the sequence of generator covers and then taking expectations. So we are replacing uh, the reference matrices one by one by the true layers of each of, of w and then bounding this, this step at each time. Now we can rewrite the, that bound as the expected statistical risk is upper bounded by the expected empirical error plus that sum of mutual informations. Then we use this inequality. This is just upper bounding a square root of a tangent line. And th this uh, important inequality in information theory which we can uh, replace, we can put a fixed prior here. So if this was P of Y, the, the marginal of Y, this, this is e equality, but if we put any other uh, probability measure, this, this will be inequality. After these two steps, we want to minimize the upper bound here on, on the statistical risk. So we define the, the distribution which minimizes this upper bound as P star. And why, why did we use these two inequalities here? Because we want to make, now the expression is linear in PS here. And therefore the algorithm P star now doesn't depend on the unknown input distribution mu. Based on this definition, it, it, it's simple to see that this algorithm P star will satisfy this excess risk bound, which is, uh, so if W hat is uh, the most index of a hypothesis which achieves a minimum statistical risk, then, uh, the risk, the average risk of P star will be uh, upper bounded by the infimum plus this chaining style bound. But so if we know what is P star and we simulate it, then we know that we will achieve this excess bound. Now the harder problem is that we, we don't know what's P star. It's a well known fact that the Gibbs posterior distribution um, is, uh, as written here, proportionate to this quality is a unique solution to, to this expression, the sum of empirical risk, the expected empirical risk plus relative entropy, where gamma is called the inverse temperature. And this dates back to the works of, work of James in the 50s on the maximum entropy method. Now compare it with our problem. P, P star, now we have, I, instead of uh, one relative entropy, we have a sum. This relative entropy here corresponds to the last term in this sum, but we have V minus one other terms as well. So this P star is a multi-scale generalization of the Gibbs distribution. And although the, the expression looks cumbersome, interestingly, we are able to characterize it exactly. We, and we can prove that it has a unique minimum. And this is a real luck because uh, 
we have the chain rule of relative entropy and we can rewrite the expression and use and, and drive all the terms to zero using a notion of tilted distributions. T tilted distribution has a simple definition. It says if P and Q are two distributions and lambda is any parameter between zero and one, the tilted distribution P, Q index lambda is just a geometric mean of these two distributions. And that's useful for linearly combining relative entropies. So again, we are, we are minimizing this expression here. If, if we first combine this expectation here plus with the last term, last relative entropy here, then this will be equivalent to this problem. We want to minimize this uh, expression of uh, entropy, relative entropies. And this is given by, by this algorithm. We, we first use the chain rule of relative entropy on this uh, term and then uh, mix the resultant term with the previous one, with, with tilted distributions. So it has two steps, uh, a marginalization step and a tilting step. And then the, the unique solution is given by this output. So in, in words, this means for, for neural nets, we have to start from the Gibbs distribution and then marginalize it out over the last layer and then rescale it and then do this again. This will give all the intermediate distributions. And then the output is given by this expression. So th this algorithm also has two, two phases. It's a backwards phase here, and then a forwards phase when simulating the, the, uh, the distribution that we want. So th this is not, is not uh, a priori efficient, but it gives a clear target. We know what's the distribution that we want to simulate. Uh, for example, one can use uh, MCMC methods to, uh, to simulate this. Uh, though MCMCs have this question of mixing times, but we believe this will, this will uh, create a new avenue for research. Uh, my current research, we are trying to learn more about MCMCs and uh, obtain an efficient uh, sampling imp implementation. Um, we already have a result for a two-layer neural net. It, it is quite good, but we believe we can do much better. And uh, if anybody here has expertise on MCC, I'll be glad to chat with. Thank you very much. So hi everyone, my name is Dimitris Kalimeris. I am a PhD student at Harvard University and I will talk about our work called SGD on Neural Networks Plans Functions of Increasing Complexity. This is joint work with the Harvard uh, Theory of Machine Learning Group and it will appear in EURIPS uh, as a spotlight talk. So two years ago, a paper called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Significant Generalization came out. The authors in this paper showed that uh, neural networks are complex enough to overfit to our data set. In particular, they can even fit random labels from the data set that we have. The implication of this is that minimizing the training error alone is not enough to guarantee good generalization, since in principle there might be many RMs and some of them might even have arbitrarily bad test error. 
So the natural question that arises is why are we actually able to find a good generalizable ERM? In particular, it has to be something about the natural distributions that we optimize over, as well as our choice of optimization algorithms, which in practice is some variant of SGD. Okay. So our current understanding is that SGD provides some sort of implicit regularization in the sense that it outputs classifiers that have low complexity. And the goal of this work is actually to investigate how this implicit bias of SGD in the function space of a neural network looks like and try to understand what low complexity means as well as the mechanism through which uh, such low complexity classifiers are produced. In particular, in this work, we make these two following claims, main claims. So during the early stages of training, SGD learns a function that is correlated with a linear classifier of the data. Moreover, once SGD finds this essentially linear classifier with good generalization, it is likely to retain it in the sense that uh, it will keep performing well on the fraction of the population that is classified correctly by this linear classifier. And here in the bottom, you can see the progress for a very simple distribution, initialization to overfitting to all the label noise that my data contains. And you can see that there is still a clear linear classifier that is retained throughout the training. Now, the question is, what do I actually mean with this essentially linear term? Do I mean that uh, SGD on an overparameterized neural network will learn a hyperplane? Of course not. So essentially linear is actually a key concept in our work. So I'm going to illustrate this to you with a very simple example. So let's assume that we are given this training set. This is just a single dimensional Gaussian. The bottom half of the, of the points are labeled as red. The upper half are labeled as blue. And we also have 10% label noise, meaning that we just flip 10% of the labels of the points randomly. Okay. This is, of course, a very easy data set to classify. Here is a very simple linear classifier that achieves almost optimal error in this data set. And uh, here, there is a much more complex classifier that also separates this data set. So this classifier here is actually a neural network trained for many, many epochs. So it starts overfitting to the label noise that my data contains. Okay, this is why the decision boundary is so weird. Now looking at these two classifiers, the question that we can ask is, are they really different? And if we look carefully, we will figure out that actually these two classifiers are not different at all. They give the exact pr same predictions in the data set that we told them to learn, in the distribution that we told them to learn. And in particular, is the classifier on the right as complex as we might believe it is in the beginning? This is, the answer is again no, and it is actually as simple in the distribution as a linear classifier. In other words, there exists a linear classifier that yields the exact same predictions of the distribution as this very complex neural network that we have here. Okay. So the core observation is that uh, the decision boundary out of distribution is completely irrelevant to characterize the complexity of a classifier. And what really matters is the complexity of the predictions in the function space that this classifier makes. So in this work, what we do first is we introduce a framework to capture this idea of performance correlation between uh, general different models. So let's assume that we're given a point x drawn from some distribution with true label y of x. And also we have two different models, a very complex one, a neural network, for example, that is trained for t time steps, and a simple one that for now we will consider it to be a linear classifier, but it can be a really simple one. And this is how we symbolize the predictions. F, F of, FT of X is the prediction of uh, the neural network on input X, and L of X is the prediction of the linear classifier. Now there are two quantities of interest here. And this is the mutual information between the classifier and the labels in our distribution. Okay. This is essentially the accuracy of that the neural network can achieve after t train steps. The second quantity of interest is the mutual information, again, 
conditioning on the simple classifier. What does this mean, intuitively again, is the extra accuracy that I gain because I know not only the linear classifier, but I also know the neural network. So this is the extra boost that I get from the neural network over just knowing the linear classifier. And uh, now we can define the performance correlation as the accuracy that the complex model achieves that is entirely attributed to the simple model, to the linear classifier. So I don't know if this is intuitive enough or not, but um, let's, let's see, for example, how the performance correlation between the two classifiers that I showed you in the previous slide uh, evolves. So here we have the complex classifier, the neural network on the right. We have the linear classifier on the, uh, sorry, on the left. We have the linear classifier on the right. And the performance, the mutual information between the neural network and the data set is actually close to one, meaning that we achieve almost perfect classification, right? Apart from the label noise. However, this uh, conditional mutual information is zero. Why? Because the neural network and the linear classifier have exactly the same predictions, meaning that we don't get anything more by knowing actually the neural network than knowing the linear classifier. So the performance correlation between these two models are pretty high, is pretty high, pretty much like is as high as the accuracy that I can achieve, telling me that um, the, the accuracy of the neural network is entirely attributed and entirely explained by a very, very simple classifier, and also implying that actually this neural network is not as complex as we might feel it in the beginning. And uh, this performance correlation is what we will use to support our claims experimentally. So let me move on and show you some graphs. So our first experiment is training a CNN to distinguish between animals and objects in CIFAR-10. Okay. The axes are, in the x-axis we have the number of SGD books that we train for. In the y-axis we have the accuracy and the mutual information. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence, so just think of it as the accuracy. The blue dotted line is the accuracy that the best linear classifier can achieve in this data set, which is actually pretty not trivial. We can achieve up to 80% training accuracy. Uh, sorry, test accuracy. So this is the train and the test accuracy of uh, our CNN. Okay, we can see that we generalize pretty well. And now this is the performance correlation between the CNN that we're training and the simple linear, the best linear classifier that we can find for this data set. Now, why is this interesting? For two reasons. The first reason is if we look at the early stages of training, what we can see is that the blue line grows exactly together with the yellow line. What does this mean? This means that all of the accuracy that the neural network gets is entirely attributed to the linear classifier, to learning a linear model. Moreover, what we can see is that the blue line plateaus exactly in the accuracy of the best linear classifier, and this tells us that we get pretty much everything that the linear classifier can give us. Okay. The second thing that is important is that uh, as training progresses, and we train for more and more epochs, this performance correlation remains completely flat meaning that we never actually lose the correlation that we found with the linear classifier. This means that we keep predicting correctly in the point that the linear classifier was predicting correctly. Okay. And the same phenomenon can be observed in different synthetic and real data sets. It seems to be pretty standard. What is interesting to note is that uh, in the upper right uh, image, where we, we train a CNN to distinguish between the first five and the last five class of CIFAR, this is actually a difficult classification problem, and there's no good linear classifier. The best, the best linear classifier achieves accuracy of 55%. However, we still, learning still starts by learning a correlation with this almost trivial classifier, and then progress to learn more concept, con uh, complex concepts. Let me now move on to our more general hypothesis that uh, actually justifies the title of this paper. So what is the general hypothesis that we, we make? What we claim is that there exists a complexity measure such that SGD first learns simple components of its final classifier with respect to this complexity measure. 
and retains the correlations with these simple components as we continue to learn more and more complex parts. Yeah. It is kind of problematic to actually show this hypothesis in full generality because we don't have a good understanding of what the right complexity measure is. But uh, in the context of image classification, for example, we can uh, use the number of convolutional layers that the CNN can have as a proxy for, uh, for this complexity measure. So for example, a bigger CNN is more complex than a smaller one. And let me show you the respective experiment. So here we're training a ResNet in this case, again to distinguish between the first five and the last five classes of CIFAR, which is actually a quite a non-trivial problem. The axes are as before, x-axis, number of SGD steps, y-axis accuracy. And we have three different dotted lines corresponding to CNNs with different number of convolutional filters. Okay, so we have the best CNN that we can find with two convolutional filters, with four and six convolutional filters. And now, these are the performance correlations that our ResNet obtains with each of these CNNs. And this is the, how the accuracy of the model keeps progressing as training, uh, as training continues. Uh, it is evident that here as well we have a clean separation of lemming and faces, even though we don't really know what the right complexity measure is. But the phenomenon still exists. Now, before I conclude, let me just emphasize that in general we state our uh, claims in terms of broadly, in terms of natural distributions uh, that we train on and natural initializations. And of course, if you try really hard, you can break this implicit bias that SGD seems to have. So in particular, it is quite easy to construct adversarial initializations for which uh, learning will not happen. So what do I mean is that uh, if we start from this initial initialization, we will, SGD will, take us, will move us towards fitting the training set perfectly, but uh, we will not generalize at all. Our the, our tests, uh, test error would be very high, like almost random. Finally, to conclude, uh, let me remind you what we did in this paper. So we introduced the performance correlation to study the implicit bias uh, of SGD in the function space of a neural network. We framed two, two hypotheses. The first core hypothesis is that SGD starts by learning an essentially linear classifier on the data and does not forget, does not lose its correlation with it as training progresses. And the general hypothesis is that there exists a complexity measure that we don't really know what this complexity measure is, such that SD, SGD gradually increases the complexity of the learning classifier and again doesn't lose correlation with the most simple parts. There are some future directions that are questions that are very interesting to answer, like uh, in particular, why does this linear learning happen? Why do we correlate so well with a linear classifier in the beginning? And what is the right complexity measure to consider? And there are some first th theoretical steps towards like, developing some theory of this kind of incremental learning dynamics for simpler models, and hopefully this will help us understand this kind of phenomena for deep neural networks as well. Thank you. Thank you.